Broadcasting from the commodity capital of the world, Zurich, Switzerland, this is Insider's Guide to Energy. This addition to Insider's Guide to Energy is brought to you by Fidectus. Go to www.fidectus.com for more information. Welcome to Insider's Guide to Energy. I'm your host, Chris Sass, and with me as always is co-host Johan Oberg. Johan, what's happening today? Uh, doing good, Chris, as always. Uh, been having one eye on COP27 that kicked off today when we started the, um, when we record this, and uh, quite interesting. Some good, interesting news coming out of it. How you been? I'm doing really well. Um, yeah, absolutely very aware of COP, especially when we've been scheduling guests. Uh, we are very aware of when that was because it, it, it bumps into a lot of our energy transition guests coming on board as well. Um, interesting to see what's going on. Today happens to be Election Day in North America, which also will have a policy say. Um, kind of, I, I think, the theme of the day, right? Even our interview today, we're going to be leaning towards policy. And, and how that impacts you. Know, you and I have been speaking to energy professionals now for a couple of years together regularly, and it almost always comes down to policy at some point of what the impact of the energy transition can be or is, in my opinion. No, I, I totally agree, and I think I think it's kind of a common theme uh, throughout the show. So it's kind of the transition, the digital, but also how how, how this politics and, and and kind of the both locally but also globally place a fact into this one and something that I'm really interested in and we, we mentioned that in the beginning of the show as well the pre-show is is you have the politics but also something that's very related is the culture around it you know usually culture is also playing a big role in this one and you know as you know I grew up in a blue color town uh, so I'm really interested also to hear a little bit about this from from uh, from today's show maybe a little bit touch on the uh, side of the energy but related anyway yeah, I'm interested to talk about policy and, and, and see what other people have to say of what's happening, you know, what some of the regulations and bills in the U.S. have done and what the impact is, right? I, I think a lot of time when there's a legislation, there's unintended consequences. Right? There's, a, there's a goodwill or a knee-jerk reaction that creates some sort of legislation. And at the end of the day, the, the chips don't always fall where people intended them to fall. So I'll see if any of that comes up in today's conversation. But I think it's... Time for us to stop talking and introducing our guest. Absolutely. I'd like to invite James Van Nordstrand to the program. James, welcome to the program. Thank you, Chris. Good to be here. So I say this every week. Johan and I, at this moment, have an unfair advantage of our audience. We know who you are. We've done our homework and we looked a little bit into your background before we invited you to speak. But our guests have no idea who you are. So let's start by who are you and what do you do? I teach energy and environmental law at West Virginia University. I also run a Center for Energy and Sustainable Development. I've been at WVU for 11 years. Prior to that, I spent uh, 22 years in the energy regulatory sphere, representing primarily investor-owned utilities in energy regulatory proceedings in the Western United States. Uh, as I transitioned into law school teaching, I also headed up an environmental NGO based in, in New York, the Pace Energy and Climate Center. So you're teaching in West Virginia, and, and, and as an American, our audience is global. Um, I think coal town, coal miner's daughter, things like that. I, I don't think renewable energy for West Virginia. Help me get my head around how someone has your role in West Virginia, or is it just old school thinking on my part? It's been a challenge. Uh, we're trying to get more renewable energy in West Virginia. I think the images you have of West Virginia, probably from a, a lot of um, movies, is is really centered around the coal industry. I think it's a it's a source of great pride in the state. It's the legacy of the state. Um, I, th I think West Virginians think, you know, we industrialized the United States on the back of the West Virginia Appalachian coal miners, and so it's a source of great pride. And that's one of the reasons that I, when I wrote my book, I, the title is The Coal Trap. It's how can you honor that legacy, that culture, that source of pride while still, you know, 
moving in this inevitable transition that's underway, positioning ourselves for the future and trying to move away from coal. It's been it's been a challenge. So when we're talking about moving away from coal, which I think is is part of also reading your book and 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 I think all over we're not just talking about West Virginia. We're talking about you know Poland and we're talking about China and a lot of other regions. In some places, we're also talking about the war on coal, which which I think is maybe a little bit different way of talking about it and gives a different sense of meaning. So, so, so where do you come from around in terms of this transition from coal? I spent a lot of time in the book talking about the war on coal. Um, I've been in West Virginia since 2011. So it was during this period when you know, natural gas, the shale gas revolution, being able to extract natural gas from shale, horizontal drilling, that was a that was a big game changer. The term was overused, but it really fits. It was a real game changer in terms of the energy industry in the United States. So, so we talked a little bit about the transition around this, and, and maybe this is more of a vocabulary thing or the way you position it. You mentioned this quite a bit in your book as well, and that is the war on coal. Was it really a war on coal, or was it more a normal transition? I think it was best described as the coal industry's response to the market forces that were happening. Um, I said, I've been in West Virginia since 2011. So I got here pretty much when the shale gas revolution, I call it the revolution, started up in terms of being able to extract massive quantities of natural gas at fairly low prices. West Virginia sits on top of the Mar- Marcellus Shale, which is now the largest uh, gas producing region in the, in the country. That had huge, huge implications for the coal industry, um, but the war on coal was was really a, had a lot to do when Obama became president. Um, we had a real focus on climate change, a real focus on greenhouse gas emission reductions. Obviously, the coal industry at the time generating electricity with coal was the largest producer of greenhouse gases in the electric industry. So when the administration decides we're going to tackle greenhouse gases, that has implications for the coal industry. The EPA became very active with uh, endangerment finding and off to the races on in terms of regulating greenhouse gas emissions. And so the narrative in West Virginia was was the war on coal. It was Obama's job killing EPA. We had billboards up and down I-79, welcomed him Obama's no job zone. So it was a way of saying everything would be fine in the coal industry if the EPA would just leave us alone. So all the politicians, it was from the governor, United States senators, congressmen, legislators, all up and down, Republican or Democrat, that was the narrative. It was it was the war on coal, and it's 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 the policies in Washington D.C. that are driving down the coal industry. And so, where is that today? Um, I mean, West Virginia is beautiful country. I, I go there as we talked about in the pre-show to go rafting or to go spend time in the wilderness. It's it's this gorgeous area. But where are those towns that were coal towns today? How are they going to make it through the inevitable that, that seems to be the energy transition underway? It's going to be a challenge. I mean, the, the coal producing regions of the state in southern West Virginia, McDowell, Mingo, Logan, Wyoming counties, Boone counties, they've been hit the hardest. And if you look at the employment statistics, you know, over, over the years, those numbers are, are way down. The populations in those towns are way down. I mean, a lot of it was just due to mechanization in the coal industry and in terms of the number of miners went down dramatically even though production in many cases was going up because you just need fewer miners when you mechanize Um, then we moved into mountaintop removal which even needs fewer miners so that transition was happening in terms of population moving away and now we're we're down to around 12,000 coal miners in the in the state probably the lowest figure in decades um, and those regions are still very hard hit. Um, there's some things, the new federal legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, I think has some programs that are targeted towards those energy communities that have been disproportionately affected by the decline in fossil fuel jobs. But it's there's a lot of work to do. And so you, you started by saying that you, you came from more of a regulatory background and, and you got in this space. So... Are you teaching law class? Is that what you're teaching right now? Yeah, I teach an energy law class and I teach environmental law classes. So, and it's really the 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 two subjects really converged. I think once once we had the Massachusetts versus EPA case in April of 2007 that says you know greenhouse gases contribute to climate change. The major source of greenhouse gases was really production of energy. And so, if you're an energy lawyer, you pretty much had to learn some environmental law and vice versa. 
And so I went to Pace University in White Plains, New York, and got my LLM. It's an advanced law degree in environmental law. And it more or less uh, transitioned from being an energy lawyer to an energy and environmental lawyer. So I teach, I teach the, uh, both, both subjects at the law school. And then how much of the policy and the law that your students are doing will be impacted by administration change? And how much does the, the, the Inflation Reduction Act and things like that become a long-term impact? Kind of like you talked about, you know, the, the change from coal to, to gas, perhaps, when, when um, the EPA rulings came out. It's a combination, I would, I think, of, of regulatory policy type changes. And then it's just... It's market forces as well, advances in technology. When you look at the decline in, in solar prices between 2010 and 2020, the decline in, in wind prices, I mean, those were the real driving forces for the demise of the coal industry, that plus a lot of cheap and plentiful natural gas. I mean, those were the drivers. And some of it's driven by, by regulatory policy and statutes and legislation. And a lot of it's driven just by market forces, you know, just uh, wind developers and solar developers spending a lot of money on R&D, research and development, making those making those facilities much more efficient and much more productive. But in, in previous shows, we've had hydrogen experts on, and one of the use cases they give for old mines is, is for storage. So is that taking place for storage for other molecule type fuels and things of that nature in West Virginia? Not yet. There's certainly a lot of interest in it with the infrastructure bill that got passed in November 2021 and the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, Inflation Reduction Act puts hydrogen and nuclear and, and carbon capture and sequestration and renewables in, in many senses on the same footing. And then we've got $8 billion to create regional hydrogen hubs. And so West Virginia is definitely in the hunt to try to get one of those. Lots of talk about the strategic uses of hydrogen, where it makes economic and technical sense. I think some in West Virginia would would use hydrogen much more than maybe maybe warranted in in terms of um, interfering with investing more in renewables, which I think is really the long term long term solution. So how do you how do you what I like about this is if you look at Silicon Valley, we'll take Silicon Valley as an example where where the shift is transition. So we started off with some Intel and then it came into software, then came into cloud. But they reinvented themselves throughout, throughout, throughout. Yeah. Not being an expert on, on the U.S. and especially not in West Virginia, but there must be a lot of knowledge, no matter what, in terms of, of energy production, in terms of energy distribution, coming out of the coal industry. So how do you, how, how does this then apply to the transition into to um, renewable energy? Because at the end of the day, it's producing and distributing energy. Uh, so there must be. S- a great deal of knowledge still there that can be capitalized on. I think there is. I mean, West Virginia often refers to itself as an energy state. My experience is it's it's more of a coal state because there's been resistance. Even when the Marcellus Shale play became a big deal, we didn't have utilities in West Virginia building natural gas plants. Um, they, in fact, they doubled down on coal plants. They the utilities in West Virginia, while the shale gas revolution was going on between 2010 and 2020, actually brought three economic, uneconomic coal plants that were formerly in the competitive wholesale markets into the regulated rate base. And so um, that's that's the, one of the themes of my book from the introductory chapter, you know, the lost decade. It's mm-hmm. like um, this transition was inevitable. And how do we position ourselves for the the next phase in the energy in the energy industry? And we didn't at all. We we just clung to coal. And so, they, yeah, I think I agree. There's a lot of knowledge about energy in the state. And if, had we really been an energy state instead of a coal state, I think we could have positioned ourselves better to take advantage of this clean energy revolution. But in fact, we we had failed political leadership that that pretty, for the most part denied that an, the energy transition was either inevitable or, or necessary. And you no, know, the coal jobs aren't, aren't going anywhere. I mean, our last, our, our governor was reelected in 2020 um, on uh, the campaign slogan was Jim Justice. He never gave up on coal. That's, I mean, that's, and so it's, it's hard to talk about. And of course we had four years of Donald Trump. He comes to Charleston, West Virginia and says the coal jobs are coming back. Jim Justice, the, a, a guy who made his fortune in the coal industry says the coal jobs are coming back. So it's, hard to talk about a transition 
when you've got political leaders who are sending the citizens a different message. There's no transition necessary. The coal jobs are coming back. Trump says we're going to put a lot of miners back to work. I mean, I think we see after the EPA was effectively dismantled under Scott Pruitt in the, in the Trump administration, the coal plants were closing down just as rapidly. Why? Because it's market forces. It's cheap and plentiful natural gas. It's renewables. The citizens of West Virginia were sold a bill of goods with the whole war on coal narrative and blaming it all on Obama's job killing EPA. We're talking about overwhelming market forces and political leaders just chose to ignore them and chose to tell people what they thought people wanted to hear rather than what they needed to hear and actually help the state manage through this transition. Which is, which is an interesting point. You mentioned that in the book as well, in the, the lost decade and, and, it's a bit of a gloom picture you're pointing or you're kind of painting here in terms of what happened and when when most of us and in, in the industry and also outside of the industry saw the transition into renewable both on the the environmental part but also purely on financials and the economics mm-hmm. around it uh so so maybe what was the reason to the last decade you mentioned some of the politicians but surely it's not a handful there must be a number of things of losing a whole decade but maybe painting the picture a little bit more positive <laughs> wait wait coming out of this now do you see any changes or is the same people going to do this transition in the same way you're going to lose another decade no i we're, i mean i think one of the big drivers was what i what i say the the coal trap in terms of it being such a source of of pride in in the state um very popular and it's almost unpatriotic to suggest that we move away from coal so that's definitely part of the part of the reason for this for the you know the failure to to basically embrace the transition no i think we are seeing some positive signs in the last in the last few years uh, you know at the same time our electricity supply is still 91 percent coal fired as of 2021 and so we're not making a whole lot of movement but there has been some some movement and i think you know we have the inflation reduction act which got passed in august which potentially provides a lot of benefits for West Virginia. We have a, this term called energy communities. If there are, there are regions that are disproportionately affected by the decline in the fossil fuel industry, so you have a coal plant closing down, a coal mine closing down, you get extra tax incentives to invest in those energy communities. That could be a real benefit to West Virginia. And I think we're starting to turn the corner. Um, the lost decade really focuses on this. Is, these are the kind of things I think we should have been doing 10 years ago, that we really lost that period of time. We wasted a lot of energy um, with this whole war on coal narrative, and that, that effort could have much better been spent positioning us for this transition. But it, it, it's underway. It's just, you know, it, it, it was... We, we knew we knew it was going to happen as early as 2009, really, which is what I, the, my, what I call the start of the lost decade, because that's when shale gas really started taking off, driving down wholesale prices, putting coal plants out of the money. Um, and that's, and then that, and that was, and then, and then since the later part of the decade, then it's renewables, right? Wind and solar are now more cost competitive than, than coal. So these are market forces and it's just a real, a real disservice to West Virginians for the political leaders to not step up to it when they themselves, I think, recognized it, but still let's, let's go along with this narrative and blame it all on Washington, DC. So you're, you're saying that the, the politics played a hand, and, and you gave a, an alarming statistics in the amount of electricity still produced by coal. And I'm assuming that's West Virginia, that statistic, that yes. that's state. Nationwide, it's about 19%. I mean, nationwide. I was going to say, the gas transition was the biggest carbon reduction yes. step, I thought, right? Exactly. Um, and now with energy transition, because even the gas transition still produces CO2, but moving to wind and solar should continue Correct. to reduce that. Um, what is the liability of one state producing that much carbon compared to its neighbor states? How is the, are there legal ramifications from still having that much coal being burned and carbon released, or is that not a consideration? Well, there's still the environmental impacts of extracting and burning coal, but those are mostly felt by West Virginians. I think it's um, it's been more of an economic impact. When I did the calculation of where our, our electricity prices went from roughly 2008 to 2020, which bookends what I call the lost decade, our electricity prices on average went up at a rate that's five times the national average. And so the rest of the country is taking advantage of low-cost natural gas. Later in the decade, they're taking advantage of low-cost and cost-competitive renewables. West Virginia didn't. Um, we don't take advantage of energy efficiency. So we were we have the lowest electricity rates in the country 
in 2008. And as of now, there are 18 states that have lower electricity prices. We do, we're still below the national average. But when you look at how fast electricity prices have gone up, the fact that the state has continues to cling to coal has been very bad for the electric, electric utility rate payers in the state. And we're a poor state. We can't afford it. That's where I was going to go. Isn't the average income in West Virginia fairly low across the United States? I think we're still the second lowest in per capita income, yeah. And so you have more expensive energy. So where are the the policies? The failure failure of energy efficiency programs means our bills, even though our rates are still, you know, the 18th, 19th lowest in the country, our bills are above the national average because we don't have any energy efficiency programs. The, The Public Service Commission does not require the utilities to offer extensive energy efficiency programs. So we don't give rate payers the tools to help manage their energy costs. So it's a it's a double hit in terms of high prices and then high bills because we have a bunch of big old leaky houses in West Virginia because they haven't been insulated. But the the, the time for change, right? Is, is that taking place now? I mean, if there's only 12,000 miners left, um, I mean, that's not a lot of people in an entire state. So have you seen whether the students coming through your classes or whether it's community wise, has the culture changed? Because pop culture's changed, right? You, you can't watch yes. TV or read or, or listen to music or whatever, not have some sort of climate indication. So has that trickled into other generations yet in West Virginia? Oh, I think the I think this generation, the students that I'm teaching and a lot of them, two thirds of the students at WVU come from West Virginia. A lot of these students have coal backgrounds in their family, their fathers or grandfathers or uncles. I don't hear much, you know, climate denial. I think a lot of them, I think not only the students, but I think a lot of the population in the state is is more is more willing and ready to move on, which is the, the leaders, political leaders don't are really holding us back, I think. But I, I think the next generation does get it. They want to have opportunities. They, they want to stay in West Virginia. They would They would like to see more opportunities, bring in new businesses, different businesses, clean energy businesses, because there's no future in the coal industry. Those you know, fewer than 12,000 miners, and it, there's just not a lot of good prospects. I mean, we run the risk of the brain drain when these students graduate from college or law school. They leave the state because they don't see you know, a whole lot of opportunity in the state. But who's lobbying or where are the dollars coming to keep these policies in place? Because if, if coal isn't in demand nationally and you're feeding your own power plants, you know, where are the economics, you know, politicians will generally follow the economics of the lobbyists. So who's, who's pushing this agenda? Fossil fuel industry. I mean, the, the West Virginia Coal Association has been very effective. They pretty much started the whole war on coal, the friends of coal. Um, they have fewer resources now than they did just because then, you know, the number of big coal companies that can, that can fund a, a large lobbying organization that has declined, but you still have just overwhelming influence of the coal industry in the legislature. Um, and then the national level, I mean, a lot of the people talking to Joe Manchin and shaping his views on energy, which, you know, and to some extent we're talking about COP27. I mean, it's not just the U.S. energy policy, but what we get across the finish line affects how much the United States can effectively lead on a global level. And it's unfortunate that because Manchin listens a lot to the American Petroleum Institute, he listens a lot to the executives of the coal-fired electric utilities. And and so that's been really holding us back in terms of seven all of the above energy strategy, which he likes to talk about. It's still it's still way too much emphasis on on coal and natural gas. But if we if we then look at the economics around which I can understand and then you have the Inflation Reduction Act coming out where there is, I haven't read through all the documentation around the IRA, but there's a lot of money being invested in this transition, which means that you there's money up for grabs. So how how do you think this will affect? Because if, if a politician follows the money, suddenly there is money in Washington he can get, and he can actually invest that in into West Virginia. Uh, is that happening or is it still... Because I, I don't get it. When there's money now on the table for the renewable transition, why is it not? It, they should jump for it. Europe, when, as soon as they, they had it, some of the poor areas, Italy, Spain, Portugal, they just ran for the money and took it right away and did a lot of good things. There is a lot of money on the table. And I, I think the energy communities, if you look at a map of the energy communities are like brownfields and then 
communities with high unemployment and communities disproportionately hit by fossil fuel, the decline of the fossil fuel industry, almost the entire state of West Virginia qualifies as an energy community. So that's that's a 10% kicker for your investment and for your tax incentives to, to, to invest in West Virginia. And, and I think Senator Manchin has been pretty good about, it, you know, touting these things that are there for West Virginians. Um, one of the things I've been talking about more recently is we don't have the policies at the state level that are necessarily embracing that and leveraging that. We have a, a governor who's a coal baron. He made his billion dollars in the coal industry. We have the Public Service Commission, which regulates our utilities. A, a current commissioner on the Public Service Commission is the former president of the West Virginia Coal Association. The chairman is a former lobbyist for the coal, oil, and gas industry and a lobbyist for um, the electric utilities. So we don't the burn the burn the coal. So we have the policies of the Public Service Commission are actually requiring the utilities to continue to operate and burn coal at the coal plants, even when it's not in the best interest of the ratepayers, even when there are lower, there's lower cost power available on the market. So you have all these signals coming out of Washington, invest in West Virginia, energy communities, renewable energy. But at the state level, where are those electrons going to go? Because we have the Public Service Commission telling our two largest utilities, we want you to keep running the coal plants at their historical capacity factors, stop backing them down and, re and replacing them with lower cost purchases on the market. We want you to keep running them at historical capacity factors. It's insane. I've never seen anything like it in all in my 40 years in the energy industry. I've never seen anything like it where a commission is telling the utilities to do something that's not in the economic interest of the ratepayers. But that's what's going on here. So you so while Washington is sending these signals, invest in West Virginia, the state is sending the signals, well, there's no room for those green electrons produced by that wind farm or that solar array because the utilities are going to keep burning coal because the Public Service Commission is telling them to do that with the governor's blessing. I, I think it's interesting. One thing I want to ask about um, in, in your response, you, you said the hydrocarbon industry and, and you threw oil and gas in is, is lobbyist against this, but your example was all clearly coal and, and statewide, because I think there's a, a lot of folks that are pro energy transition, but understand that it might be really hard to get rid of hydrocarbons totally today. Mm -hmm. and, and so I don't know that in your answer, and this is just from what you said, that I heard that gas and oil, although, you know, part of, you know, hydrocarbons were, were the exact culprits that, that maybe they are, but in a lobbying, I don't see why they'd be lobbying for coal, right? I mean, they're, they are making transitions. There's still going to be uses in certain circumstances for hydrocarbons for some period of time, Yes, unless you want the economy to stop and the way of living that we're comf comfortable with to go away overnight. Um, but I don't know that's true about coal, right? I mean, I, I don't know. Is there is there a use case that I don't understand that we still need coal in the future that, that the other hydrocarbons aren't covering? No, I mean, there's, um, I mean, you have the use of met coal to, to make steel and that's, and that's one of those industries where, you know, where there are substitutes, if you're using coal to generate electricity, there are substitutes. We use renewables, zero carbon substitutes, or even nuclear, but zero carbon substitutes. There are some uses of coal for which there aren't substitutes. And that's where you need to focus on. That's where you deploy the hydrogen or you deploy the carbon capture and sequestration technology. There's still too much talk about uh, hydrogen and carbon capture and sequestration as a way of extending the lives of coal plants. And that's where the concern is that there's going to still be a lot of, of just uneconomic, foolish investments because we need to be very strategic about where we deploy hydrogen, where we think about carbon capture and sequestration. And it has to be in those areas where we can't substitute non-zero carbon sources for it. But there's going to be, a there's you know, Senator Manchin, just about a month ago, says that we're going to have an 1,800 megawatt carb, um, combined cycle combustion turbine generating plant, burning natural gas, generate electricity, and it's going to have carbon capture and sequestration. Well, why? Well, because they get an $85 per ton tax credit for 12 years. And that plant might be economical for 12 years, depending upon where natural gas prices go and where wholesale power prices go. I suspect that plant's not going to be economical when the $85 per ton payment for capturing and sequestering the carbon disappears and so isn't that money better spent just you know investing investing in battery storage technology or renewables or 
or hydrogen, the strategic deployment of the lower carbon resources, hydrogen, where we where we don't have better substitutes. And I think there are better substitutes, um, better ways of generating electricity than continuing to rely on, on coal or natural gas. Isn't this one of the problems? We've seen this in the um, uh, on the show before with other guests, where where you have short term versus long term strategy thinking. So okay, it might be the best thing to do actually start taking the hit and doing the transition because in 12 years or 10 years, whatever that subsidy is gone, it will pay off. But very few, including corporates, maybe including our consumers and especially politicians will not take that decision. So how does that work and, and not being in, in an American, how does that work on, on a state level? Who, who decides for the long term strategic decisions for for your energy uh policies because energy is not just the lies here it's it has to do with national security it has to do with so many things it plays around maybe that's a problem <laughs> it's a big problem in in west virginia i mean i've um my background having the, spent the five years with the new york public service commission and then trying utility cases in front of 10 different commissions um the state utility commissions have a lot of of authority and a lot in terms of shaping the signals that they send to utilities in terms of what we want you to invest in. Do, do we have a rigorous integrated resource planning process where we expect you to acquire a portfolio of resources that results in the lowest cost to customers over time? That's very important. You want the utilities to really sharpen their pencils and say, hey, we need to close down this coal plant early and replace it with, with wind and solar and battery storage technology or maybe, in, maybe natural gas in the short term. We don't have that in, in West Virginia. And all the other states that I'm familiar with, um, they're more of a, a central energy planning or rigorous rigorous planning process um, required by the utility commissions. So you're making sure the utilities are managing their resources in a way that's going to hold costs down for customers. That's And that's, um, that's sorely missing in West Virginia because we've been going down this coal path um, for the last 10 years unnecessarily. And that's that's caused a huge variance in terms of what ratepayers are paying now versus what they would be paying had there been a rigorous integrated resource planning process and had utilities diversified into energy efficiency, um, natural gas, wind and solar. How does this change? You know, talking about it, being frustrated about it, I can clearly hear the emotion when, when you speak and the passion about the, the situation. It seems to be changing elsewhere in the United States. So it seems like you're a pocket or an anomaly across the United States. Is that a reasonable perception? Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think so. I mean, Wyoming is also fighting pretty hard to, to keep their coal plants open. Wyoming is the number one coal producing state in the country. West Virginia is number two. I mean, there have been some positive changes. Uh, I think in just in the last three years, 2020, the legislature, the legislature is getting it. I think, you know, a big driver in terms of the decarbonization, the energy industry are the job creators, the large employers who have aggressive corporate sustainability goals. And so our economic development folks in West Virginia, they meet with the these job creators and, they, and the job creators say, well, can we get access to renewable energy in West Virginia? Because we've got this goal that says we're going to be 100% renewable by 2030 or 2040. How we, how's it going to work out for us? Well, I said, well, we're 91% coal-fired, so not so much. And oh, by the way, our electricity prices have gone up at five times the national average over the last 10 or 12 years. But our legislators, legislature is starting to hear that. And so in 2020, they passed a bill that said we can now have third-party power purchase agreements for solar arrays, right? So, so the folks wanting to install rooftop solar don't have to pay those upfront costs. You can finance them through a power purchase agreement. That was Ill- illegal prior to 2020. 2021, they passed another bill that gave the utilities the authority to develop renewable energy programs. You could you could de- you could develop 50 megawatt solar arrays, tranches of 50 megawatts, and make those available for these large customers who want access to renewable energy. And then just about a month and a half ago, we had Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Berkshire Hathaway Renewables, saying we will build a 200 megawatt um, renewable solar array with battery storage, basically an industrial park, a microgrid. And the legislature had to base, had to pass a bill to carve that out from PSC jurisdiction. Basically, what Berkshire Hathaway can do whatever they want within that microgrid with their 200 megawatts solar array and battery storage technology. So there's going to be precision cast parts and other Berkshire Hathaway companies that locate there. But the legislature stepped up 
and said, what's it going to take to get Berkshire Hathaway to come to the state? Well, if you're going to have to give them a microgrid where the PSC can't get its fingers on it and, and mess it up. And so the legislature responded to that. So they're getting the message because they know we've got, we have to attract those jobs and the job creators are demanding renewable energy and low cost energy. But in my mind that to some extent that just highlights the real problem is well, why does Berkshire Hathaway demand that it be that it, that it be not regulated by the Public Service Commission that kind of sort of highlights the real problem um, because they have a, a lot of authority they're really driving the energy policy and it's being driven in a very very bad way for the ratepayers yeah it's <laughs> it sounds like it's um, it's qu quite of a journey one thing I have to go back to, to, to West Virginia as you know when we when we start looking at energy in in in, in anything in production you, you have natural resources so of course in, in Virginia if I understand it correctly you have the coal in the ground you have the gas if the transition or let's say when the transition that we like to talk on on this show how is West, West Virginia then um, positioned for for renewable is is it a, is it um, is it a lot of sun? Is there a lot of wind? Can you build this, or is that also a, a kind of an obstacle in order for, for, for making this transition happen? I mean, our sunlight isn't great, but you look at the surrounding states, we get, we get, get as much sun as Pennsylvania and Ohio and, and um, Kentucky and Virginia. Um, and so that's that's not an issue. And as as, he, as technology has improved for solar, that's not really a, a barrier, I don't think. And wind, we've already got um, 600 megawatts of wind fire generation in the state due to renewable energy policies of the surrounding states. You can put your wind turbines in West Virginia and still get credits in the wholesale market for the renewable energy aspects. Lots of good wind potential in West Virginia. Um, it's just, you know, the policies, the state policies don't really em embrace that. To some extent, there's still this zero sum game that says, well, every electron that's generated with wind or solar is electron that's not generated by coal. But I think there has been, there is a lot more interest because I think that the solar is and wind to a lesser extent is pretty much untapped potential. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of, a lot of interest in coming to West Virginia and, and particularly with the incentives from the Inflation Reduction Act, it's, we need to have, you know, stronger stronger policies that encourage you know the utility should be buying that the output from wind and solar arrays hmm. and those are cheaper resources for uh, customers and continuing to run coal but that's not the signal that the regulators are giving them much of what you're talking about is state level power right so yeah. how is the federal mandate interacting you know the state's rights versus the federal rights you know, from kind of your legal perspective, how, how is that imp impacting all this? Because I'd imagine at a certain point they're going to come to a head, right? Because it's clearly not where the United States as a whole seems to be much further ahead than the state. So where do state rights and federal rights kind of combine on the energy policy here? Well, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, you know, has adopted very pro-competitive policies in terms of, of these competitive wholesale markets. So West Virginia operates in the PJM wholesale market, which is 13 mid-Atlantic states. And I think FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has done a good job of making sure that those, that the way the energy is priced and the auctions and the market, the way the markets are designed, um, provide those opportunities you know and what i was saying in terms of a, a wind or solar array if you don't have the utilities in west virginia acquiring the output what's the option for the developer they're going to sell it directly into the wholesale market so you have to figure out well can you then you have the transmission bottlenecks those those are still issues in terms of the queues to get an interconnection from from pjm the path would be easier if if the utilities in west virginia really um, responded to policies that were embraced renewable energy and said, hey, we'll take that wind output, we'll take that solar output, and then and the developers aren't left to selling it into the wholesale markets because those prices are going to be less certain and, and much, a much less attractive deal than some kind of a long-term purchase agreement, agreement with, uh, with an investor on utility. So it's, it would help, uh, but you know, I think the federal policies um are, are helping but you know the energy markets and retail prices and retail rate making is all all done at the state level and uh it's you're really dependent to a large extent on what is the what kind of what kind of signals is the industry getting from state law and state policies do you have a renewable portfolio standard or a clean energy standard or an energy efficiency resource standard or a rigorous integrated resource planning process we have none of those things in west virginia and so it's a hard it's 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 hard for a developer to say, to, to say well 
we, we don't really have a track record for you know the, the you know business is open for you know for renewable energy in West Virginia. We haven't sent out those signals very very well yet. Even though, like I said, with the Inflation Reduction Act, there's there's lots of incentives to do that, but we don't have this policy at the state level to embrace that. So with your with your expertise, your experience in this transition, now being in, in, in the last decade living in, 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 in West Virginia, with the Inflation Reduction Act now coming in, where, difficult question I know, because we're always trying to think long term, but where would you see, is there anything specific from the, the Investment Reduction Act that you see, this is the one we should get now, that will help us short term, but maybe also help us to, to kind of bridge or to overturn this culture of yes it's possible kind of a thing is there anything specific that you would like to see well the tax incentives for for the clean energy manufacturing jobs uh you know we talk about a just transition the fact is that the clean energy jobs generally don't pay as much as what the coal miners used to make right so we need so part of the inflation reduction act we have to be prevailing wages but but you know we need to be looking for those those white collar jobs where you're building manufacturing facilities, whether it's solar or wind, you're building or energy efficiency products. So you're you're building those manufacturing facilities. It's not just the job for the solar array installers or the wind, you know, putting installing the wind turbines or energy efficiency measures installing those at your house. It's, it's the jobs associated with the manufacturing. There's lots of tax incentives encouraging that as well. So that's. That's where your long-term play and your long-term higher-paying jobs, I think, are attracting those sorts of jobs to West Virginia. So, and we need to be going after that. But you know, the, the we need to be sending a stronger signal at the state level as a matter of policy that we 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 are embracing this clean energy future. We want the the jobs in the clean energy and man and the associated man, associated manufacturing jobs. So as we approach time here, we're getting to the the, the end of our program. Um, if if these coal plants continue to shut down, is there money needed then environmentally to shore things up? So if you if you do transition to cleaner energy, are, are we leaving kind of a lot of damage from, from the mines or are these things that can gracefully shut down without needing a lot of money in them themselves to stop operation? Well, the coal plants themselves, I mean, they're, 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 they become brownfield sites, you know, and there's lots of interest in redeploying those sites. You got all the infrastructure there, the transmission lines. Um, so lots of interest in, in nuclear. West Virginia just repealed a prohibition on nuclear. Can we build small modular reactors, the SMRs? Can we put those on the same sites that the coal plants were? A lot of interest in that. Senator Manchin, I think, is interested in that. So those are, those are opportunities in, in terms of the coal mines themselves, I mean, there's just been widespread destruction, failure to restore the land. You know, the West Virginia is the number two state in terms of abandoned mine land that hasn't been properly reclaimed. So it's these environmental scars that are still that are still left. Of course, the in, in, in infrastructure bill gave $11.3 billion to start reclaiming some of these abandoned mine lands. West Virginia is number two in terms of the number of acres. So those jobs, that, that money starting to be rolled out, those are pretty good, pretty good jobs. So there's a lot of the environmental carnage that's already occurred that still needs to be, needs to be cleaned up. Johan, any final thoughts as we wrap this episode up? As always, Chris, I have a thousands of more questions on my on my notepad, but unfortunately, we're not. I would love to go into more of the culture and, and also maybe touch a little bit on the the nuclear uh, road as well as the base load because it, it's it's yeah. I'm always a bit curious here when we talk about nuclear as being the base load because yes, it works. It's kind of sustainable depending on who you ask. Exactly. But is it worth it in terms of pricing? Because we exactly really that's that's the challenge. You can't get the. It's not cost competitive. Um, hmm got to get we need the zero carbon baseload generation but I'm, I'm not sure we can get there fast enough with nuclear no i think um, but with that i think uh, really interesting discussions and uh, i learned a lot more also from from an american point of view around this so i really appreciate you coming on thanks thank you again for being a guest on the show i, really I heard it thanks chris i hope you've enjoyed it like you say i enjoyed it as well it was educational um a little disconcerting, kind of that pocket of my homeland that, that's a little bit different. Uh, you know, I, I lived in Maryland before I moved here, just just around the corner from from West Virginia. Um, I hadn't realized the the situation, the statistics that you quoted on the show. Um, for our audience, we hope you've enjoyed this conversation as well. We hope you found it enlightening. Um, 
if you want to be part of, part of the conversation in Discord, please send comments. If you see this and you listen to the YouTube or something, comment. We'll respond. I'm sure our guests will respond to you as well. Um, share the episode, subscribe, follow us, and we look forward to speaking to you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.